that feeds us this morning is from the Gospel of John, previously read, specifically John chapter 10, verse 24. So the Jews gathered around Jesus and said to him, How long will you keep us in suspense? If you are the Christ, tell us plainly. So far our text, dear brothers and sisters in Christ. The Simpsons is America's longest-running sitcom. It first aired its cartoony episode in 1989, and it's still going. It is currently in its 30th season. There is an episode of The Simpsons where Homer, the laughably hapless father figure, is in a doctor's office with his wife Marge, receiving word about the state of his health from Dr. Hibbert. Dr. Hibbert says, Homer, I'm afraid you'll have to undergo a coronary bypass operation. Homer replies, say it in English, Doc. Dr. Hibbert reiterates, you're going to need open heart surgery. To this, Homer replies, spare me your medical mumbo jumbo. Dr. Hibbert tries again. He says, Homer, we're going to cut you open and tinker with your ticker. Homer says, could you dumb it down a shade? <laughs> At that point, his wife Marge interjects. The comedic scene gives way to the narrative arc of the episode. I'm thinking of the scene from The Simpsons wherein Homer is simply incapable of hearing and understanding the seriousness of the surgery that awaits him because a similar thing is happening in John chapter 10. In John 10, Jesus is in the temple. He's in Jerusalem during the Feast of Dedication. You would know that as Hanukkah. And while he is there, he is surrounded by a group of opponents who say to him, How long will you keep us in suspense? If you are the Christ, tell us plainly. But like Homer Simpson, who is incapable of hearing the diagnosis of Dr. Hibbert, those who had surrounded Jesus in the temple courts were incapable of hearing Jesus' messianic claims, no matter how plainly he spoke to them. And so Jesus replies to those who asks him, he says, I have told you, but you do not believe. Now this is not to suggest that Jesus' ministry consisted of him walking around Galilee and Jerusalem saying, I am the Christ, I am the Christ, I am the Christ. It's so much more than that. First of all, Jesus of Nazareth is not Jesus the Christ in the way that uh, Bruce Wayne is Batman or Kent Clark is, uh, Clark Kent, excuse me, is Superman. Jesus of Nazareth doesn't have a powerful alter ego called Jesus the Christ. No, he's, he's one and the same. He doesn't need to conceal his identity by cloak and dagger. In fact, Jesus' very conception in the womb was announced by angels. His birth was proclaimed by heavenly hosts. Jesus' entrance into the world was observed by the shepherds. His birth was announced by the manifestation of a star that the wise men saw from the east. All these things have come to be known. John the Baptist preceded him, pointing the way toward Jesus. Jesus' identity as the Christ was ratified by the Holy Spirit who descended upon him in the form of a dove at his baptism in the Jordan River, and he continued to display his power and identity in the works that he did, signs and wonders and miraculous powers. Jesus has been doing the work of the Messiah all along, and now he's got people surrounding him. Tell us plainly, who are you? Jesus throws his hands in the air. He says, my works, my works bear witness about me. Maybe you remember those. The great Sunday school story where Jesus is in a crowded house and friends are bringing sick people to see Jesus. They can't get in the house, so they climb on top of the house. They cut a hole in the sod roof and they lower their paralytic friend down to Jesus 
from above. And, and Jesus, he says, Son, your sins are forgiven. And as soon as Jesus forgives the paralytic his sins, the Pharisees and the scribes and the elders have an absolute coronary. They can't, you, you can't do that. Only God can forgive sins, they say. Well, Jesus knows that. And so he asks them. He says, which is easier? To say that your sins are forgiven? Or to tell this paralytic to pick up his mat, arise and go home? Of course, they don't reply. So Jesus continues and he says, so that you might know that I have the authority to forgive sins on earth. I say unto you, rise, pick up your mat and go home. And the man does. The paralytic does as he's told, this miraculous power of healing a man who is paralyzed so that he can walk home. That was done so that Jesus might proclaim to everyone else, I am the Christ. I have the authority from my Father in heaven to forgive sins. But they did not believe. Why? Why won't they look at the signs? Why won't they hear of Jesus raising the dead, restoring sight to the blind? Why don't they hear about him casting out demons or turning water into wine? Why won't they believe his ability to heal cripples and walk on water and multiply the loaves and the fish? Do the crowds really need to hear Jesus say one more time, I am the Christ? Those exact words in that exact order at that exact time and place? No. They don't need to hear that. Their failure to believe is not because Jesus has spoken in cryptic messages. It's not because Jesus hasn't been clear enough with them. How ridiculous. How absurd to suggest that Jesus is so calloused and prideful that he would uh, stubbornly uh, hide his identity, deceptive and unwilling to do what it takes to let people know that he's the Christ. How absurd to think that Jesus won't do what it takes when it is Jesus who dies on the cross, scorning its shame for the salvation of the world. No, the failure of these particular opponents of Jesus was the result of them not being part of God's flock, which means they don't hear God's voice and they do not follow Jesus. And because they do not hear and will not understand and do not follow Jesus, then they do not receive the gifts that only Jesus gives, eternal life and the security that comes with it that no person, no enemy will snatch them out of the Father's almighty hand. When Jesus' opponents command him to tell us plainly Jesus says, I have told you. And it's at that time that Jesus appeals to his works and his signs. Jesus isn't playing favorites, by the way. Uh, Jesus' enemies weren't the only people who wondered if he was the Christ. Jesus' friends wondered that too. Think of that. Jesus' friends had their moments of doubt. John the Baptist, who for crying out loud baptized him in the Jordan River, finds himself imprisoned. Things aren't going very well, and he begins to wonder if Jesus is who he said he is. So he, he sends messengers to Jesus, and he asks a similar question. He says, are you the one who is to come, or should we look for another? And what does Jesus do? He says, go tell John what you hear and see. The blind receive their sight, the deaf hear, the lame walk, lepers are cleansed, the dead are raised up, and the poor have good news preached to them. When Jesus' identity is questioned by friend or foe, the program is the same. He points to the works that he does in his Father's name. He appeals to the mission for which he was sent. I told you, but they wouldn't believe. So when they won't believe, 
Jesus actually complies with their request. He speaks to them plainly. He speaks to them in the language of shepherds and sheep, a rich biblical image. Abel, the beloved son of Adam and Eve, was a shepherd. Abraham, the father of Israel, was a shepherd. Moses, the leader of the Israelites out of Egypt, he was a shepherd. King David was a shepherd. And as we say in Psalm 23, the Lord is my shepherd. Shepherds are not some lower middle class folk. No, they are acquainted with royalty and God. I am the good shepherd, Jesus says. He speaks to them plainly, and when he's done talking, he concludes with the clearest statement one could ever make. He says, I and the Father are one. Simple, simple mathematic equation. This plus this equals this. I and the Father are one. The Jews asked Jesus to speak clearly. And it doesn't get clearer than I and the Father are one. But it's like Dr. Hibbert telling Homer Simpson that he's going to cut him open and tinker with his ticker. What did the Jews do when Jesus speaks clearly and plainly? The next verse is, and I quote, the Jews picked up stones again to stone Jesus. Jesus gets a little cheeky with them. He says, oh, uh, I'm sorry, for which, which one of the Father's works are you going to stone me? It's not what you've done. It's not your good works that we're going to stone you. It's that you who are a man have made yourself equal to God. They get it. They heard it. They even understand it. He has declared himself to be the Christ, the Son of God. They don't like it. Such are the actions of those who do not belong to the God and his flock. These are the actions of those who do not know their shepherd's voice. They refuse to follow him. Even worse, they seek to kill him. I am delighted to say that you and I are in a different scenario than Jesus' opponents from John chapter 10. We are in a different scenario because unlike the people who want to kill Jesus, you and I belong to Jesus' flock. We are part of his sheepfold, which means that we hear his voice and we believe him. We hear Jesus when he says, the works that I do testify about me. And there is no greater work that Jesus has done than his death on the cross and his resurrection on the third day. There's a reason why Good Shepherd Sunday is put within the season of Easter. Because the Good Shepherd lays down his life for the sheep in order that he might take it up again. Is there anything more plain or clear than victory over death? I'm talking real, true victory. I'm not talking about death as some portal that leads you to some disembodied afterlife. Every religion on the planet believes that. Christians are hardly unique to believe in an afterlife. No. What we believe that is so darn unique is that this body that God has created us to be will one day undie and never die again. We, in our bodies, will live forever. Point me to the rich religion that believes that. And you will only point me to Jesus, who is one with the Father. Such eternal victory over death by our Messiah is the source of our hope. And we believe it. For we know his voice and we have heard him say, it is finished. Yes, it is. As the sheep, we have followed Jesus directly to the tomb, and there it lies vacant 2,000 years later, because death no longer has dominion over our good shepherd. If this death-reversing God is for us, then who could possibly be against us? Well, everyone, actually. If God is for us, who could be against us? Everyone could be. 
Everyone can be, but it's irrelevant. Because no one, not even death, can snatch us from our Father's almighty hand. That's a wonderful message of eternal life. You and I keep nobody waiting in suspense. You and I speak this good news plainly so that all may understand it goes like this. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Hallelujah. It's just as Jesus plainly said, you are his sheep, you know his voice, and you have followed him. Amen. Now may the peace of God that passes all human understanding keep our hearts and our minds in Christ Jesus until life everlasting. Amen.